Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India When we discuss the Matthew effect in the communication system, what I mean we have discussed uh, reward system in science, the Matthew effect in the reward system, the Matthew effect uh, in the communication system now uh, we are going to uh, end. Okay? I mean there is reason to assume that the communication function of the Matthew effect is increasing. Okay? Is increasing uh, in frequency and intensity with the exponential increase in the volume of scientific publications, which makes it increasingly difficult for scientists to keep up uh, with work uh, in their field, in their respective fields. Okay? Perhaps no problem facing the individual scientist today is more defeating than the effort to cope with the flood of published scientific research even within one's narrow specialty. Studies of the communication uh, uh, behavior of scientists that, that within the purview of the Matthew effect in the communication system, okay, uh, it, it shows uh, it has shown that confronted with the growing task of uh, identifying uh, significant work published in their field, scientists search for uh, cues. Okay, to what they should attend to. One such cue is the professional reputation of the authors. The problem of locating the pertinent research literature and the problem of authors wanting their work to be noticed and used are symmetrical. That is the vastly increased bulk of publication stiffens the competition between the papers for such, I, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, stiffens the competition for uh, uh, competition between papers for such notice. The American Psychological Association, uh, almost uh, 50 years back, okay, found that from 15 to 23 percent of the psychologist readers' behaviors in selecting articles were based on the identity of the authors. The workings of the that, that's what that's what Robert Martin pointed out. The workings of the Matthew effect in the communication system require us to draw out and emphasize certain implications about the character of science and its associated scientific practices. And they remind us that science is not composed of a series of private experiences of discovery by many scientists, as sometimes seems to be assumed in inquiries centered exclusively on the psychological processes involved in discovery. Okay? Then science is public, science is not private. Okay? It is true that the making of a discovery is a complex personal experience and since the making of the discovery necessarily uh, precedes its fate. According to Merton, the nature of the experience is the same whether the discovery, I, I mean whether the discovery temporarily fails to become part of the socially shared culture of science or quickly becomes a functionally significant part of that culture. That is why from the very beginning I said Merton was a functionalist uh, within the paradigm of sociology and social anthropology. And and his functionality, his functionalist orientation has delved into uh, 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 the uh, such examination of science uh, and, and the kind of inequalities uh, uh, that science has always, uh, uh, science is always endowed with. Okay? 
But for science to be advanced, it is not enough that fruitful uh, ideas be originated or new experiments developed or new uh, or new problems formulated or new methods instituted. The innovations must be effectively communicated to others that after all is what we mean by a contribution to science, a contribution to science within quote. Okay? Something that is given to the common fund of knowledge, common base of knowledge. Okay? In the end what we get? In the end then science is a socially said and socially validated body of knowledge. Okay? For the development of science only work that is effectively perceived and utilized by other scientists then and there matters. In investigating the processes that shape the development of science, it is therefore important to consider the social mechanisms that curb or facilitate the incorporation of would be contributions into the domain of science. Looking at the Matthew effect from this perspective, from the perspective of the communication system, okay, we have discuss what we have discussed okay uh, uh, that the the i mean the 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 distinct possibility that contributions made by scientists of considerable standing are the most likely uh, to enter promptly and widely okay into the communication networks of science and so to accelerate its development okay then what we have discussed till now if you look at we we have discussed Matthew effect in science, how the reward and uh, communication systems of science are considered. Okay? The, the, the Matthew effect uh, in science, uh, Matthew effect uh, in, the, in the world of science, how Martin tried to delineate uh, uh, the psychosocial processes which affect the allocation of rewards to scientists for their contributions. That is an allocation which in turn affects the flow of ideas and findings through the communication networks of science. Okay? And such conception is based on upon an analysis of, of the composite of experience reported in uh, Harriet Jackerman's interviews with Nobel laureates in the United States and upon data drawn from uh, the diaries, letters, notebooks, scientific papers and biographies of other scientists. Harriet Jackerman was a collaborator of uh, Robert Merton and his second wife. Uh, and then we have discussed uh, within Matthew effect in science that the reward system in science, the Matthew effect in the reward system and the Matthew effect in the communication system. In the lectures to follow, what we are going to discuss that the Matthew effect and the functions of redundancy, social and psychological basis of the Matthew effect and the Matthew effect uh, and allocation of scientific resources. Okay? In this context, we are going to discuss now the Matthew effect and the functions of redundancy. Constructed in this way, constructed the way we have discussed the Matthew effect in the reward system as well as the Matthew effect in the communication system. Okay? Such Matthew effect in science links up. Okay? the functions of redundancy in science. When similar discoveries are made by two or more scientists working independently, I mean it refers to multiple discoveries, okay? the probability that they will be promptly incorporated into the current body of scientific knowledge is increased. The more often uh, a discovery has been made independently, the better are its uh, prospects of being identified and used. If one published version of the discovery is obscured by noise in the communication system of science, then another version may become visible. Okay? And this leaves us with an unresolved question that is what is that unresolved question which Martin poses that, that, that how can one estimate what amount of redundancy is independent in independent efforts to solve a scientific problem will give maximum probability of solution without entailing so much replication of effort that the last increments will not appreciably increase the 
probability. Okay, that is a significant question on how can uh, uh, how can one uh, estimate what amount of redundancy in independent efforts to solve a scientific problem will give maximum uh, probability of solution without entailing so much replication of effort that the last increments uh, will not appreciably increase the probability. I mean this this question perhaps was not resolved by uh, uh, Merton himself. Okay. In, in, in examining the functions of the Matthew effect for communication in science, now let us refine this conception a little further. Okay. It is not only the number of times a discovery has been independently made and published that affects its visibility, but also the standing within the stratification system of science. I mean science also is stratified that is why it is uh, unequally distributed une in a uh, it is distributed in an uneven manner. Okay. That is why I just said that it is it is uh, I mean it is not only the number of times a discovery has been independently made and published that aff affects its visibility, but also the standing within the scientific I mean within the stratification system of science of the scientists who have made it to put, put to, to put the matter to put the matter uh, with undue simplicity um, a single discovery introduced by a scientist of established uh, reputation may have as good a chance of achieving uh, high visibility as a multiple discovery variously introduced by several scientists uh, no one uh, of whom has yet achieved a substantial reputation. Although the general idea is at this writing, at this uh, discussion, okay, tentative, it does have the not inconsiderable virtue of lending itself to approximate test. One can examine citation indexes, indices, uh, 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 indexes to find whether in multiple discoveries. Uh, by scientists of markedly unequal rank and file, okay, it is indeed the case that work published by the scientists of higher rank is the more promptly and more widely cited. To the extent that it is, the findings will shed some light on the unplanned consequences of such stratification uh, system for the development of science. Interviews that, that Jackerman and Merton uh, uh, conducted with uh, with Nobel laureates, with scientists about their reading practices can also supply data bearing on the on such hypothesis. Okay, this on such tentative solution to a problem or hunch. Okay, so much for the link between the Matthew effect and the functions of multiple discoveries in increasing both the probability and the speed of diffusion of significant new contributions to science. The Matthew effect also links up with the finding reported elsewhere that great talents in science are typically involved in many multiple discoveries. The statement holds for Galileo and Newton, for Faraday and uh, Clark Maxwell, for Hooke and others uh, and, and also for most Nobel laureates okay, according to Merton. Okay. It holds in sort for all those whose place in the pantheon of science is largely assured, however much they may differ in the scale of their total accomplishment. The greatness of these scientists rests in their having individually contributed uh, a body of ideas, methods and results, which in the case of multiple discoveries has also been contributed by a sizable aggregate of, of less talented. Uh, uh, individuals, okay, scientists. For example, we have found that. Uh, I mean, I mean. Uh, for example, you will find that more scientists they get lesser amount of rewards and recognitions, and a very very few scientists, well known scientists, those who have already got name and fame, they are endowed with more and more rewards and recognition such inequality persists. By examining such such studies, uh, 
now we can detect some underlying psychosocial mechanisms psychological as well as social mechanisms that make for the greater visibility of contributions reported by scientists of established reputation. This greater visibility is not merely the result of a halo effect such that their personal prestige rubs off on their separate contributions. Rather, certain aspects of their socialization, their scheme of values and their social character account in part of part for their visibility of their work. Okay? Having, having discussed, I mean we have till now, till now we have discussed the reward system in science the Matthew effect in the reward system, the Matthew effect in the communication system and the Matthew effect and the functions of redundancy. Now, let us see the social and psychological basis of the Matthew effect and then we will discuss the Matthew effect and allocation of scientific resources before moving on to the Matthew effect in science. How may, uh, I mean how the cumulative advantage and the symbolism of intellectual property I mean they are exhibited in terms of uh, uh, Matthew effect in science. Okay? But before, before dwelling upon uh, cumulative advantage and symbolism in the intellectual property uh, or symbolism of intellectual property, we will discuss the social and psychological basis of the Matthew effect. Even when okay, some of the contributions have been independently made by an aggregate of other scientists. Okay. The great scientist or, or the, the scientist who has already acquired that eminence okay, serves distinctive functions. It makes a difference and often a decisive difference for the advancement of science, okay, whether a composite of ideas and findings is heavily concentrated in the work of one scientist or one research group. Okay, or is thinly dispersed among a great number of individual scientists as well as organizations or research institutions or universities. Okay? Such a composite, such a composite tends to uh, take on a structure sooner in the first instance than in the second. It requires a Freud, so, I mean psychology of mind, a study of mind, Sigmund Freud. Okay? It required Freud for instance to focus the attention of many psychologists upon a wide array of ideas which as has been shown in, uh, shown in many many works uh, um, had in large part also been hit upon by various other scientists. Such focalizing may turn out to be a distinctive function of eminent uh, 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 persons of science, I mean eminent practitioners of science. Okay. I mean such such uh, one Freud, okay. I mean uh, uh, Freud was one uh, you may say uh, Fermi may other uh, another okay. uh, uh, Delbruck uh, may another. I mean they play a charismatic role in science. I mean way the way we talked about the paradigms, Kuhnian paradigms in science, I mean uh, uh, Ptolemy, Copernicus in astronomy. Okay. Uh, then Galileo also of course, uh, came in uh, in astronomy, uh, and Newton and Einstein in physics, uh, okay. uh, Darwin in biology. Okay. They played a charismatic role in science, they played a leadership role in science. Okay. Such paradigms excite intellectual enthusiasm among others who ascribe exceptional qualities to them not only do they themselves achieve excellence, they have the capacity to evoke excellence in others. This is very important. In the compelling phrase of uh, one, one uh, Nobel laureate uh, uh, with whom uh, Jackerman uh, uh, conducted uh, 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 an interview, okay? uh, I mean he said uh, that, 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 uh, that uh, Nobel laureate said, now, um, they provide a bright ambience, such paradigms, such paradigmatic figures, such charismatic leaders, they provide a bright ambience. It is not so much that these great practitioners of science pass on their techniques, methods, information and the theory to um, novices okay, working with them. 
more consequently they convey to their associates the norms and values okay, that govern scientific research. I hope by now you know the normative structure of science, institutional imperatives of science, ethos of modern science outlined by Merton. Okay. I mean universalism, communism, disinterestedness and organized skepticism that we have already discussed. Okay. That is why the, the great practitioners of science, the eminent scientists, okay, they always they, they often convey to their associates the norms and values that govern scientific research. Often in their later years or after their death, okay, this personal influence becomes routinized in the fashion described by Max Weber uh, for uh, other fields of human activity. Charisma okay, becomes institutionalized in the form of schools of thought and research establishments. In fact, Max Weber uh, characterized uh, different types of authority, maybe traditional authority, maybe rational legal authority or maybe charismatic authority. And what uh, uh, Martin was trying to refer to what Martin was trying to make a reference to okay, that was Weberian uh, 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 version of charismatic authority which Bierstedt said uh, it may be charismatic authority or leadership. Okay. The role of such, such charismatic leaders, okay, such outstanding practitioners of science in influencing younger gen associates is repeatedly emphasized in the interviews with Nobel laureates conducted by Harriet Jacquard. Almost uh, to, a, to an individual, they lay great emphasis on the importance of problem finding. I mean, that is what we have, we have learnt that identification of a problem research question in science is, uh, is very important. Okay. Not only uh, problem solving, okay. I mean you have to first of all identify a problem and then you have to solve that. Okay. They uniformly express the strong conviction that what matters most in their work is, is a developing sense of taste, of judgment okay, uh, in seizing upon problems that are of functional or, or fundamental importance. Okay. And typically they report that they acquired this, this, this sense of taste, the sense of judgment okay, okay, uh, for, the, for the significant problem during their years of training in evocative environments. Reflecting on his on, on, on their years, uh, uh, reflecting on if, if a novice, uh, if, a, uh, if a junior scientist uh, okay, who has not yet acquired uh, such uh, name, fame, uh, reward, recognition, uh, and so on. Okay. Uh, uh, I mean, reflecting. If you ref, if some some uh, junior scientist reflects on on such such practices, okay, in the laboratory of a chemist of the first rank, one one laureate, uh, as Jackerman puts it, reports that uh, see or he led me to look at look for important things whenever possible, rather than to work on endless detail or to work just to improve accuracy rather than making a basic new contribution. Okay. Another Nobel laureate described uh, her or his uh, socialization uh, in a European laboratory uh, the, and let me quote here uh, as my first real contact uh, with first rate creative minds at the high point of their power. I acquired a certain expansion of taste. It was a matter of taste and attitude and to a certain extent real self confidence. I learnt that it was just as difficult to do an unimportant experiment, okay, often more difficult than an important one. Okay. I mean what, what, what we are getting from this quotation, I mean from this, uh, uh, from, uh, from this interview. Well, conducted by Harriet Jackerman. Okay. There is one rough measure of the extent to which the laureates were trained and influenced in particularly creative research environments. The number of laureates each worked under uh, uh, in 
uh, were done in earlier years. Okay. Now, apparently it is not only the experience of the laureates and presumably other outstanding practitioners of science in these environments that accounts for their tendency to focus on significant problems and so to affect the communication function of the Matthew effect. Certain aspects of their character also play a part in this NDF. With a few exceptions, these are um, practitioners of exceptional ego strength. Their self assurance finds varied expression within the context of science as a social institution. That is why from the very beginning we have said science is a social institution, science is a social creation. Okay. And that social institution as we know includes a norm calling for autonomous and critical judgment about one's own work and the work of others. Okay. With their own tendencies reinforced by such norms, the laureates exhibit a distinct self confidence which at the extreme can be loosely described as attractive arrogance. Okay. They exhibit a great capacity to tolerate frustration in their work absorbing repeated failures without manifest uh, psychological damage. I mean let me let me quote again one one uh, laureate's view. Okay. Research is a rough game. You may work for months or even a few years uh, and seemingly you are getting nowhere. It gets pretty dark at times then all of a sudden you get a break. It is good to have somebody around you uh, to give a bit of encouragement when it is required. Though attentive to the cues provided by the work of others in their field, the novelists are self directed practitioners of science moving um, confidently into new fields of inquiry once they are persuaded that a previous one has been substantially mined. In, in these activities they display a high degree of uh, venturesome fortitude. They are prepared to tackle important though difficult uh, problems rather than settle for easy and secure ones. Thus, a laureate uh, 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 as, as Jackerman puts it, I mean recalls having been given early in his career a problem about which there was no risk. All I had to do was to analyze the uh, uh, chemical composition of certain materials. You could not fail because the method was well established, but I knew I was going to work on something else instead and the whole thing would have to be uh, created um, because nothing was known about it. She or he then went on to make one of her or his prime contributions in the more risky field of investigation. I mean one cannot keep herself or himself with the existing methods with the existing problems one must go beyond the existing methods one must go beyond the existing uh, areas of research, research questions. Okay. This marked ego strength links up with this scientist selection of important problems in at least two ways. Being convinced that they will recognize an important problem when they encounter it, they are willing to bide their time and not settle too soon for a prolonged commitment to a comparatively unimportant one. Their capacity for delayed gratification coupled with uh, that, that, that uh, uh, capacity for delayed gratification coupled with self assurance leads to a conviction that an important problem will come along in due course and that when it does their acquired sense of taste will enable them to recognize it and handle it. This such such attitude that ego strength okay, has been in reinforced by their early experience in creative environments. There, association with eminent scientists has demonstrated to their talented novices as didactic teaching never could nah, that see or he can put uh, set her or his sights high and still cope with the problem that she or he chooses to study. Emulation is reinforced by observing successful though often delayed outcomes. Indeed, the idiom of the laureates reflects this orientation. They like to speak of the big problems and the fundamental ones, the important problems and the, uh, and the beautiful ones. The, these 
they distinguish from the pedestrian work in which they engage while waiting for the next big problem to come their way. As a result of all that, okay, as a result of all this, uh, their papers are apt to have the kind of scientific significance that makes an impact and other scientists tend to single out their papers for special attention. The, the character structure of these leading scientists may contribute to the communication aspect of the Matthew effect in still another way which has to do with their mode of presenting their scientific work. Okay? Confident in their powers of discriminating judgment, a confidence that has been confirmed by the responses of others to their previous work, they tend in their exposition to emphasize and develop the central ideas and findings and to play down peripheral ones. This serves to highlight the significance of their contributions, raising them out of the stream of publications by scientists having less socially validated self esteem who more often employ routine exposition. Finally, such character structure and an acquired set of high standards often lead these outstanding scientists to discriminate between work that is worth publishing and that which uh, in their candid judgment is best left unpublished though it could easily find its way into print. The laureates and other scientists of stature often report scrapping research papers that simply did, did not measure up to their own demanding standards or to those of their colleagues. Okay? I mean, if you, if you look at this, uh, I mean outstanding scientists, scientists of eminence okay, tend to develop an immunity to insanable, uh, uh, I mean insanable, uh, um, uh, I mean the, the each to publish okay, uh, uh, since they, since such outstanding scientists they prefer their published work to be significant and fruitful rather than merely extensive their contributions are apt to matter. This in turn reinforces the expectations of their fellow scientists that what these eminent scientists publish at least during their most productive period will be worth close attention. Once this once again this makes for operation of the Matthew effect as scientists focus on the output of such uh, em, eminence uh, whose outstanding positions in science have been socially validated by judgments of the average quality of their past work. And more closely the other scientists attend to this work, the more they are likely to learn from it and the more discriminating their response is apt to be. For all these reasons, cognitive material presented by an outstanding scientist may have greater stimulus value than roughly the same kind of material presented by an obscure one. Okay? A principle which provides a psychosociological, I mean, I mean socio-psychological basis for the communication function of the Matthew effect. And this principle and this principle represents a special application of the self-fulfilling prophecy somewhat as, as uh, we see in the paradigms. I mean, uh, paradigm may be uh, Copernicus or Ptolemy or uh, Newton or Einstein or Darwin. Okay? In this context, it is, it is important that, that like, like other self-fulfilling uh, prophecies, uh, such, such, um, uh, such social and psychological basis of the Matthew effect, okay? this one I mean this one becomes dysfunctional under cert certain conditions. For although eminent scientists may be more likely to make significant contributions, they are obviously not alone in making them. Okay? After all scientists do not begin by being eminent, uh, the history of science abounds in instances of basic papers having been written by comparatively unknown scientists. Okay? only to be neglected for years. Consider the case of Waterston that uh, Merton uh, has cited that uh, whose classic paper on uh, molecular velocity was rejected by the Royal Society as nothing but nonsense or of Mendel who deeply disappointed uh, by the lack of response to his historic papers on heredity refused to publish the results of his further research 
or of Fourier whose classic paper on the propagation of heat and had to wait 13 years before being finally published in by the French academy. Okay? I mean then what when, when the Mackey effect is thus transformed into an idol of authority, okay? non recognition of, uh, of scientific works, okay? it violates the norm of universality embodied in the institution of science and curves the advancement of knowledge. But next to nothing is known about the frequency with which these practices are adopted by the editors and referees of scientific journals okay, and by other gatekeepers or, or other so called gatekeepers of science according to Martin. Okay. This aspect of the workings of the institution of science remain, remains largely a matter of anecdote and heavily uh, uh, um, uh, motivated gossip. Okay. Now, having, having discussed the social and psychological basis of the Matthew effect in science, let us move our attention to the Matthew effect and how scientific resources have been allocated in this okay, the Matthew effect and allocation of scientific resources. Okay. One institutional version of the Matthew effect uh, apart from its role in the reward and communication systems of science as we have already discussed requires at least a short review. I mean this is expressed in the principle of cumulative advantage that we are going to discuss in the lectures to follow on cumulative advantage and symbolism of intellectual property. Okay. Such, such institutional version is expressed in the principle of cumulative advantage that operates in many systems of social stratification to produce the same result. The rich get richer at a rate that makes the poor become relatively poorer. Thus, centers, the, uh, the, thus centers of demonstrated scientific excellence are allocated for larger resources for investigation than centers which have yet to make their mark. In turn, their prestige attracts a disproportionate uh, share of the truly promising graduate students. This disparity is found to be especially marked at the extremes. Six universities, namely Harvard, Berkeley, Columbia, Princeton, California Institute of Technology, and this and Chicago, which produced, according to Merton, 22 percent of the doctorates in the physical and biological sciences produced fully 69 percent of the PhDs who later became Nobel laureates. Moreover, 12 leading universities managed to identify early and to retain on their faculties these scientists of ex uh, exceptional talent. They keep 70 percent of the, of the future laureates in comparison with only 28 percent of, of other PhDs they have trained. And, and finally, the top 12 universities are much more apt to recruit from other American universities than they are uh, other recipients of the doctorate. Half the, la half the laureates who were trained um, who were trained outside the top 12 and who worked in a university moved into the top 12, but only 6 percent of the sample of the doctoral recipients did so. Merton dwelt upon Jackerman's uh, uh, findings to make such statements. And these social processes or psychological processes upon which we try to allocate our resources, okay. these social processes of, of social selection that depend the con concentration of top scientific talent create extreme difficulties for any efforts to counteract the institutional consequences of the Matthew principle in order to produce new centers of scientific excellence. Now, till now then what we have discussed? I mean we have discussed the reward system in science, uh, the Matthew effect in the reward system, the Matthew effect in the communication system and uh, the Matthew effect and the functions of redundancy. And then we have discussed social and psychological basis of the Matthew effect, the Matthew effect and allocation of scientific resources which is uneven, which is based on inequality. I mean this is this, this exercise we are doing to, to reflect on uh, the kind of inequalities mm, which are very much prevalent uh, in the world of science and also among the practitioners of science. Okay? Such account of the Matthew effect 
is another i mean is 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 a small exercise in the psychosociological um, analysis uh, of the uh, of the workings of science as a social institution the initial problem is transformed by a shift in theoretical perspective as originally identified the matthew effect was construed in terms of enhancement of the position of already eminent scientists who are given i mean i mean who are who are given disproportionate credit in cases of collaboration or of independent multiple discoveries okay its significance was thus confined to its implications for the uh, um, for the reward system in science to summarize I'm, I'm, we are now trying to summarize the entire uh, uh, the, the such six points okay six bullet points that we have we have which we are we have discussed by by shifting the angle of vision we note other possible kinds of consequences this time for the communication system of science i mean uh, i mean by shifting the angle of vision we note other possible kinds of consequences and this time for the communication system of science the matthew effect may serve to heighten the visibility of contributions to science by scientists of acknowledged standing and to reduce the visibility of contributions by authors who are less well known we let what we have done that we have examined the psychosocial conditions and mechanisms uh, i mean mechanisms underlying this effect and find a correlation between uh, the redundancy function uh, that that we have already uh, discussed the matthew effect and the functions of redundancy that the redundancy function of multiple discoveries and the focalizing function of eminent practitioners of science that is a function which is reinforced by the great value these these that these practitioners place upon finding basic problems and by their self assurance this self assurance which is partly inherent partly the result of experiences and associations in creating in creative scientific environments and partly a result of larger so social validation of their position it they, it encourages them to search out risky but important problems significant problems and to highlight the results of their inquiry a macro social version of the matthew principle is apparently involved in those processes of social selection that currently lead to the concentration of scientific resources and talent okay then then having discussed how matthew effect in science i mean uh, how it uh, it captures the uh, i mean uh, the 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 reward and communication systems i mean how it captures both reward and communication systems of science we'll move on to the matthew effect in science okay and within that we'll discuss cumulative advantage and the symbolism of intellectual property which merton uh, discussed okay after 20 years of his engagement uh, with the matthew effect in science with inequalities in science okay yeah. first one he published in science the journal science in 1968 and then he published his paper uh, uh, in isis in 1988 okay it is it is very important to to look at uh, look at uh, the matthew effect in science uh, i mean part 2 if i take it take the the first one as part 1 i mean uh, the the inequalities in science i mean the reward and communication systems of science as part 1 and uh, i mean uh, uh, martin took cumulative advantage and the symbolism of intellectual property as part 2 okay and then in this what we are going to discuss we are going to discuss the matthew effect broadly the the accumulation of advantage and disadvantage for scientists okay within the rubric within the broader framework of science itself the accumulation of advantage and disadvantage among the young i mean the junior scientists 
then the accumulation of advantage and disadvantage among scientific institutions, organizations, research institutions and so on, universities, then what are the countervailing processes and then the symbolism of intellectual property in science. Okay. And the kind of symbolism in, uh, of intellectual property in science that we are going to discuss, okay. but in detail we will discuss how science uh, which has hitherto been a public resource has been transformed into an intellectual property. We will discuss this towards the, the, uh, the, the last uh, lectures, okay? not now, it is the last modules we will discuss. Okay? In this context, we will start with overall the, the Matthew.